Transduction refers to the conversion of one form of energy into another. In the nervous system, visual transduction involves turning energy from photons of light into electrochemical neural signals. To begin, let's look a bit more closely at the properties of light. Light is one type of electromagnetic radiation carried by tiny particles called photons that travel all around us in waves. Although we're not often aware of it, we're surrounded by all sorts of electromagnetic radiation that vary along a vast spectrum of sizes. These different types of electromagnetic radiation have waves of different lengths, so their size may be referred to as their wavelength. The largest waves are those that carry AC electricity, which are about a thousand meters long, while the smallest are tiny gamma rays around 0.1 angstroms, or 100 billionth of a meter. Other waves between these two, such as radio and television waves, microwaves and x-rays, are quite useful to us and are constantly around us throughout our lives. As you are probably aware though, we are unable to see any of these waves. The reason that we humans can't see these waves is that our visual systems can only detect a very narrow band in the electromagnetic spectrum. Humans are only sensitive to wavelengths from roughly 380 to 740 nanometers. And so we call this range visible light. We can see the components of white light if we separate the wavelengths with the prism. And within this range, we perceive different wavelengths as different colors. For example, we perceive blue when we're presented with a 450 nanometer wavelength, whereas we perceive red when we're presented with a 700 nanometer wavelength. Interestingly, some animals can see other wavelengths. Rattlesnakes are known to detect infrared light, which are longer wavelengths than the visible human range. Snakes use this ability to find suitable shelter detect predators, and to find vulnerable prey. Some birds, on the other hand, such as the European starling, can detect wavelengths shorter than human visible spectrum, in the ultraviolet range. Many birds have coloring on their plumage that is only visible under ultraviolet light, meaning that birds likely see very different markings on each other compared to what we see on them. Okay. Now that we understand some of the properties of light across the electromagnetic spectrum, let's look at what happens when the light enters your eye. This is a cross section of the eye. So we're looking at it from its side through its center. Light begins its journey at the cornea, which is the transparent protective layer over the outside of the eye. Once light passes through the cornea, it then travels through a small opening called the pupil, which is the dark circle in the center of the eye. The size of the pupil changes depending on how much light is in the environment. In dim light, it dilates to become larger, allowing more light in, while in bright light, it constricts to let less light in. The opening of the pupil is adjusted by the iris, which gives the eye its characteristic color. Some of the most common eye colors are brown, blue, and green. Directly behind the pupil is the lens, which is responsible for bending light to focus the image onto the retina. The thickness of the lens can adjust depending on how much the eye needs to focus. For example, if you want to focus in the distance on a tree, the lens would focus the light reflecting off the tree into the back of your eye. To change the focus of the lens for different distances and sizes, there are tiny muscles attached to either side of the lens that allow it to become either thicker or thinner depending on the image. Once the light has passed through the lens, it then travels towards the back of the eye. 
it makes contact with the retina, which is a sheet consisting of a number of specialized neuronal cell types which communicate with the rest of the brain via the optic nerve. It's here the transduction occurs. So let's look a little bit closer at the retina itself. If we zoom in on the retina, we can see it is composed of three different layers of cells. Although these cells are located in the eye, they're actually neurons. The rod and cone cells at the back of the retina are sensitive to light, so they're collectively known as photoreceptors. And it's here that light signals are converted into an energy form that the nervous system can understand, an electrochemical signal. One odd thing about the arrangement of the photoreceptor layer is that photons entering the eye have to travel across several other cell layers before they meet the rods and cones that understand their message. Because the rods and cones are the first step in visual transduction, we'll first focus on what happens in these cells before introducing the other retinal cell types. This is what rod and cone photoreceptor cells look like under an electron microscope. Photoreceptors are a very specialized sensory cell. That is, they are designed to respond to specific incoming signals from the outside environment. So, in this case, these sensory receptors are specifically designed to respond to photons of light. When a light stimulus interacts with a sensory receptor, it causes a change in the cell's permeability to particular ions, which then affects the release of neurotransmitters. Let's look more closely at these photoreceptors to see what's happening inside these cells when they interact with light. If we first focus in on the rod and cone cells, we can see that although they have different shapes, they have very similar characteristics. Both cells have terminals, which synapse with the next layer of cells, a cell body containing the nucleus and other cellular machinery, and an outer segment that contains disks of visual pigments. This is the part of the rod and cones where photons of light begin the process of transduction. If we look even more closely at the structure of these disks, we can see the chemicals that allow our eyes to convert light into neural signals. In this rod cell, the light absorption happens in these disks. If we zoom in further to the lipid bilayer of the membrane, we find a specialized membrane-bound protein known as opsin, shown here in color. If you look at the center of the opsin, you'll notice a dark-colored molecule called retinol. Collectively, the retinol and opsin structure is known as rhodopsin. In the dark, the retinol is bound to the opsin in a very specific conformation. However, when a photon of light makes contact with these component molecules, rhodopsin changes its conformation. This leads to a change in the membrane permeability, allowing ions to enter into the photoreceptor cell, thus creating an electrical signal. Let's remember that here, we are talking about specifically rod photoreceptors and not cones. Rods are sensitive to almost all colors within the visible light spectrum. Thus, rods are very good at sensing white light, which is made up of the entire visible light spectrum. On the other hand, this lack of specificity means that rods cannot sense different colors as they cannot distinguish between different wavelengths. Sensing color is achieved by the second type of photoreceptors, cones. Humans have three different types of cones, each with a distinct type of opsin sensitive to different ranges of wavelengths. The short cones respond to wavelengths in the blue end of the spectrum, so are also referred to as blue cones. The medium cones respond to an overlapping but slightly longer range in the green portion of the visible spectrum. So, they're also called green cones. Lastly, the long cones respond to a longer wavelength in the red end of the spectrum. So, as you can guess, are also referred to as red cones. Unlike rods, cones 
collectively convey information about color. The colors we perceive depend on which types of cones respond and how much signal each sends to their targets. So, as light enters through the eye, it makes its way to the back layer of the retina, reaching the discs in the outer part of the photoreceptors. When the light reaches the photoreceptors, it causes a conformational change in the light-sensitive rhodopsin molecules, which in turn alters ion movement across the membrane, initiating the release of neurotransmitters from the photoreceptor cells. Once photoreceptors transduce light photons into electrochemical signals, they begin the process of transmitting visual information towards the visual cortex and other parts of the brain. This process begins by photoreceptors releasing neurotransmitter at the synapse located at their terminals. Photoreceptors synapse with two distinct types of neurons, bipolar cells and horizontal cells. The horizontal cells modulate the signal that is passed from the photoreceptors to the bipolar cells, which in turn pass the message onto the next layer in the retina. After the bipolar cells, the signal is sent to the next synaptic junction, which involves two other cell types, the retinal ganglion cells and the amacrine cells. The amacrine cells, like the horizontal cells, modulate the activity in a sideways direction so it grooms the communication between the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells. Finally, the axons of the ganglion cells, which make up the optic nerve, carry the signal away from the retina towards the brain. Therefore, the flow of neuronal information runs in this direction, from the back of the retina to the front, and then out of the eye via the optic nerve. Taken together, the retina is one of our most vital sensory transduction sites. Light is funneled and focused through the front of the eye to the retina. Once at the retina, specialized photoreceptors convert light signals into electrochemical signals that can be used and processed by the nervous system.